1969, two more Mariners flew past Mars, and they had better TV cameras and, and different instruments, and um, they showed a, a clearer view, including the South Polar ice cap, which you see in the center there, a strip of images that uh, show in great detail this uh, frozen ice expanse. Uh, other instruments on Mariners 6 and 7 showed that the temperature at that ice cap was a couple hundred degrees, a few hundred degrees below zero Fahrenheit. About I think it was about 290, if I'm remembering correctly, but uh, I probably need to check that. But anyway, very, very cold. Cold enough that um, carbon dioxide gas freezes and becomes dry ice. And um, so even more hostile than we had thought, uh, by this time people were starting to think that you know, compared to Mars, Antarctica looked like a van vacation spot. So um, the other thing that was interesting was that Mariner's images showed some features that turned out to be very intriguing later when we had better images of them. You'll see that in a moment. But at the moment, they went unrecognized, so we'll find out what those are in a sec. Well, in 1971, NASA had an opportunity to really take a, another quantum leap in the exploration of Mars because that year Mars came unusually close to the Earth, uh, just under 35 million miles. Uh, and um, because it was so close, NASA could send a heavier spacecraft um, with the same rockets they had available for previous missions. And so they sent uh, Mariner 9, which had a uh, rocket engine to go into orbit around Mars. And Mariner 9 had uh, instruments that would provide global photographic coverage of the planet. It would measure the planet's topographic variations. Uh, because it would be in orbit for long periods of time, it could study variation in surface features. Uh, there would be many opportunities to probe the structure and composition of the atmosphere, as well as to look at the circulation of the air. And... Um, to monitor surface temperatures with an infrared radiometer, and also a nice opportunity to get the first close-up images of the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos. Well, Mariner 9 arrived at the height of a global dust storm, and on the left, you can see in the fall of 1971 what it looked like. Mars was basically uh, featureless, except for a, a few dark spots, and when they did a little image processing, they realized that these dark spots had craters in them. And then they realized, well, wait a second, if, they, if we can see it through all these dust, all this dust, they must be very high above the surface, and they must be on mountains. Well, you don't find craters uh, randomly scattered at the peaks of mountains uh, several times. And so they realized that this must be giant volcanoes on Mars. And lo and behold, there is one of them on the right, actually the largest one, it's called Olympus Mons. It is so big that if you plunked it down on the United States, it would cover Arizona. And the summit crater is the size of Rhode Island. So this is, in fact, the world's largest volcano on a world half the size of Earth. And there were other surprises. Um, there was a canyon system as long as the United States, uh, which told of tremendous forces that had ripped the crust of Mars apart billions of years before. This uh, is just an enormous canyon system that was later christened for the Mariner 9 spacecraft in, in uh, Latin, Valles Marineris. Um, the Grand Canyon, just for your reference, would be about the size of one of the tiniest little gashes at the edge of this uh, giant canyon system. And perhaps the greatest surprise of all was that on this planet that everyone thought was so uh, desolate and uh, dry was a sign that uh, it had once been much warmer and much wetter. There were channels that looked like they had been carved by running water, and uh, there were uh, variations in the climate preserved as layers of ice and dust at the Martian poles. And so these were tremendously intriguing signs that the Mars we see today was not the Mars of billions of years ago. Well, at that point, NASA was already looking ahead to an even more ambitious mission to land on Mars and search for life there. And here you see the Viking lander, 
which was launched in 1976. Actually, there were two of them. They were each equipped with uh, cameras, uh, a robotic arm to dig into the surface and scoop up samples of Martian dust, and uh, actually uh, instruments on board to look for signs of microbial life and also to analyze the chemistry of the surface. And there on the right, you also see a, um, another sort of arm or fixed boom with instruments to analyze the, uh, the weather on Mars. Well, the, the Viking lander was encased in its own entry capsule. Uh, by the way, the entire uh, spacecraft, the lander spacecraft, had to be sterilized uh, at a temperature of a couple of hundred degrees for about 40 hours before leaving Earth. That was very hard on state-of-the-art electronic equipment. And so that's one of the reasons why it was tremendously difficult to, to develop all the parts and pieces on the Viking lander. And you can see on the uh, right the, uh, the entry sequence, the landing sequence. The lander would separate from the orbiter. Um, it would um, go into the atmosphere, use a heat shield to slow down, followed by a parachute, followed by uh, retro rocket engines, which would take it down uh, to the surface. And the entire sequence takes about 10 minutes. But of course, everything would have to happen on board, controlled by the onboard computer. There was no astronaut to take over like Neil Armstrong did in case there was a big boulder or a crater in the way. And there was no mission control to uh, help keep it on course. So everything that Viking did had to be done completely on its own which made it certainly a very harrowing moment for everybody on Earth. Now, I was at JPL as a Viking intern, as a college student, when the first pictures came down from Viking 1. Uh, my professor, my geology professor, uh, Thomas Much, was uh, on national television as the pictures came in. And there you see what uh, we all saw. The top picture is a strip uh, pointed roughly at the foot pad on the spacecraft and you can see very clearly uh, rocks and um, pebbles and a kind of a, a very fine dusty surface. Now the bottom picture is uh, looking out at the horizon with a wider field of view and you can see a rock strewn surface that looks deceptively Earth-like because of the very bright sky. Now everybody had thought that the sky on Mars would be dark because the air is so thin. But it turns out that there is a lot of dust that just floats in that very thin atmosphere, and it scatters sunlight and makes the sky look surprisingly bright. But when the color pictures came down, they revealed that indeed the red planet is red uh, because the, the very fine dusty coating on everything and the dusty uh, material all over the surface is coated with a layer of iron oxide, uh, otherwise known as rust. And so this gives the surface a reddish hue, and it even colors the sky a kind of a salmon or peach color, depending on which uh, photograph you look at. Now, the interesting thing was when uh, Dr. Much, the leader of the imaging team, and my professor um, asked for them to take, asked for uh, mission planners to take a picture of the sunset on Mars, he got a little bit of resistance for that because nobody thought it would be very good or that it would have very much information in it, but it turned out to be very good and very interesting. And you can see on the bottom right that when the sun sets on Mars or when it rises, the, uh, the sunlight is now interacting with the dust in a different manner than during the daytime. It's actually uh, doing what's called forward scattering instead of back scattering, and this causes the sky to be blue. So it's the reverse of what it is here on Earth. The, sun, uh, the sky on Mars during the day is pink, and at sunrise and sunset, it is blue. 